I woke up with an unpleasant feeling in my stomach. One of his hands was on my ass, and the other was trying to squeeze into my private part. I had a very bad headache that I knew was not caused by the alcohol we drank the night before. CGE honey, I don't really like mornings, I muttered. Sorry, he whined. But what about all those stories you told me about how you and Mark had sex all night and then half the next day? I was 20 then, I grumbled. When you are 20 years old and you are madly in love, you can live on sex. Oh, he said sadly. He looked like a hurt puppy. And I again wondered if I was making a mistake. On paper, it seemed like everything would be perfect for me. I was trading a 40-year-old man who worked all day and then came home and worked on his car for a 30-year-old man who worshipped the ground I walked on. Mark was dedicated to his fucking job and accumulating dollars for what he thought would be our future. CG was devoted to me. Mark, although not controlling or close to violence, always seemed to argue with me. If I put my foot down and stood firm, drawing a line in the sand, he would just look at me with a weird little smile on his face and walk away. Things weren't supposed to work like that. When my mother wanted something, my father did it as he was supposed to. Eventually, he realized that, as has been said too many times to repeat, happy wife, happy life. Mr. Mark Clayton would then look at me with a look that seemed to say, bitch, you're crazy. If I pulled out the big guns and refused sex, he would shrug and work more on his car. I hated that Dan Mustang with a passion, and that was the strangest thing. The lack of sex must have turned him into a babbling idiot. That's what my mother told me. But a couple of days after I started refusing him, he developed a strange habit of looking at his watch. It's really good that women are smarter than men. Otherwise, I wouldn't understand it. I noticed a calendar in our kitchen with a big red circle around next weekend. There were also several days leading up to this, including the day that was circled. It didn't make any sense until I went through his sock drawer and found a brochure for a high-end brothel in Las Vegas. Right on the cover of the brochure was a photograph of various women who looked as if they would caress and satisfy my husband's manhood for free and would kill me for the opportunity to do so for money. They were all pretty, well-built, and very young girls at that. I almost went into shock. I think what pissed me off the most was that he had already crossed out this day off, and it wasn't even lunchtime yet. I wasn't stupid, and there's no way I'm letting him go off and have sex with a bunch of professional sluts. I knew what would happen after this. He would have tried to put my ass out to pasture in less time than it took his Mustang to hit 60 miles per hour, which was less than five seconds. So that night, knowing where my fucking bread was buttered, I asked him to have sex with him. I was beside myself with anger, and in the end, my feelings were hurt. Nope, he said. He said it so quickly that it sounded like an afterthought, like something so insignificant in importance that it doesn't even deserve attention. I was sure steam was coming out of my ears when the tables turned. Come on, Mark, it's already been a week, I whined. I'm just not in the mood, he said. I could caress your male instrument, I smiled, trying to look sexy. It was a struggle, especially when my biggest dream was to bite off his instrument and spit it into the fireplace. Please, baby, let me satisfy you, I begged. I don't know, he said, as if thinking it over. You're not very good at this. It just seems like you're just trying to get it over with. Maybe in a week. Shock ran through me, and this has always been the case with us. I tried all the crap I learned from TV, magazines, and my mother to come out on top, but Mark always seemed to have the upper hand. CG, on the other hand, idolized me. I was his goddess. All I had to do was say jump, and he was in the air. Why haven't I left Mark for CG yet? For two reasons. First of all, deep down I love Mark. I hate his work ethic. I hate that shit because of his sense of responsibility, and I hate the fact that he just doesn't want to take the shit out of anyone. The second reason is even more practical. CG, with all his intense worship and caressing, God, I'd love it when he kisses my ass, earns minimum wage, or something like that working in a bar. He's fun to be around and does everything I tell him to do, but there's no way he can support me financially. Mark, the idiot I married, makes six figures. Maybe that's why he's like this. Okay, it wasn't always like this between us.
When we first met, we were very much in love with each other. But 20 years and about a million arguments have forced us both to raise our defenses against each other. As I tried to remember what it was that turned our eternal love into endless longing and then turned it into burning hatred, CG invaded my thoughts. He gently stroked my legs, hoping to lift my spirits without making me angry. That gentle foot rubbing always turned me on so much when Mark did it. CG, on the other hand, just annoyed me. CG, move closer to me and caress my breasts, I told him. Seriously? He choked with delight. I nodded to him, and he quickly rolled up to me and caressed my breasts, I told him. Seriously? He choked with delight. I nodded to him, and he quickly rolled up to me. I didn't want to tell him that his rubbing of my legs was irritating me, and it was distracting me from my thoughts. On the other hand, my large breasts were as fake as my blonde hair. After surgery, I noticed that I had lost most of the feeling in the butts on my breasts. Mark could always make me feel good there in a way no one else seemed to be able to. That was another thing I hated about that bastard. He was really good in bed, and his manhood was definitely significantly larger than CJ's. Mark could always leave me shaking like a puddle of goo on the floor. I found it hard to believe that he never cheated on me. It's even harder to believe that he really loved me and continues to love me to this day. This will be very difficult for him. But that's good because it means I can always go back to it if I need to. In fact, I wouldn't have to leave Mark at all if he didn't have to win every Dan argument. If he had just let me control everything the way it was meant to be, we would have been much happier. In fact, if I had been in control, I would have been a much happier wife and would have made him the happiest bastard on the planet. But he pissed me off too often. It was actually CG who made me realize that I was truly in control. He told me that in a divorce, the woman always gets everything, and the husband ends up living in his mom's basement, eating tuna straight from the can. CG himself lived with a woman who wanted to marry him, but she wasn't really what he was looking for. They weren't married, so leaving her wouldn't be a problem. That's right, you know, Chu. Today is the day you call him, CG said between caresses of my breasts. And then I remembered plan. We've been planning this for weeks. We were waiting for the perfect moment, and this week was perfect. This was perfect because Mark was out of town. It was perfect because both CG and I were cowards. Neither of us had the courage to tell my husband to his face that I was leaving him and seeking a divorce. I almost vomited just thinking about it. I mean, I have a little sense of right and wrong. And I just thought it was disgusting to call this man when he was out of town on business, working his ass off to pay for a house that I just needed, and for my car, and for all my clothes, and for jewelry, and even for the food I ate. Mark deserved better. He deserved for me to sit down with him and talk about our relationship and how we both felt. If we agreed that there was no way to save our marriage, then we would have to discuss all possible options. Then, and only then, should we discuss divorce. And after the divorce, we will both be free to move on to other relationships. This was a decent way to do it, but we didn't do it that way. In more than 20 years of marriage, Mark never hit me. He didn't even raise his voice to me. When we couldn't agree on something, he tried to compromise. This was one of my biggest problems with him. He was too easy to climb. He was always ready to settle for less than everyone else. But if we couldn't compromise, he'd just get this funny little grin on his face and walk away. Over the years, I began to know exactly how he thinks. I knew exactly what that look meant. It meant, fuck you, bitch. If you don't agree to half, you won't get anything. It meant, who wants sex with a 40-year-old when I can go to Vegas? And so over the years, I got angrier and angrier. And I was at a time in my life where I just needed it all. So in a divorce, I will get everything. I'll get my house, all my stuff, and most of his money. And then when the time comes for him to retire, I will also receive half of his pension. I talked to a lawyer. I made him draw up divorce papers. I talked to my mother, and I talked to many of my friends. They were all confident that it would work, but they all also agreed that I shouldn't do it. What irritated me was that my mother, who always hated Mark, told me that I was out of my mind for even thinking about divorcing him.
but their opinion only angered me and made me even more determined. My lawyer, who was only interested in making money, was the one who came up with the reason for the divorce. I was going to report mental abuse and neglect. The basis for our divorce was that Mark, working all this damn time, abandoned me emotionally. It was a lie and a stupid lie, but it would give me the freedom and control over my life that I wanted. Deep down, I hated him for being so blind. But it's a tough world, and he's a big boy. He'll get over it with time. Besides, if I took my time and talked to him about these things, he probably would have tried to compromise or he would talk me out of it. And sometimes, you just have to whack the bastard over the head with a gun to get his attention. I felt like I was at one of those do unto others before they do unto you moments in my life. I took a deep breath and picked up the phone. CG redoubled his attention to my unconscious bud, as if he wanted to push me forward. The sounds of trucks could be heard from behind the house. Probably one of our neighbors delivered the furniture. I dialed a number that I had learned all too well over the years. It rang once and then connected in the middle of the second ring. It must be a coincidence. He almost seemed to expect me to call him. Mark, I asked carefully. Who else can answer my phone, he asked. His flippant ways made me hate what I did a little less. Why the hell are you calling me, he asked. He spoke as if it was something strange or unexpected for me to call him. After thinking about it, I realized that he was right. I haven't called him in years, except to ask for something for myself. This man worked his ass off to give us a better life, and I pretty much ignored him for a very long time. Maybe what I want will be good for both of us. Maybe I could let him keep a little more money. I mean, I didn't need to hurt him. I just needed to be free. I'm your wife. I didn't need to hurt him. I just needed to be free. I'm your wife, I said. Mark, I was so close. I was on my way to the promised land and at the finish line. Sweat ran down my forehead and dripped onto the white-skinned angel beneath me. She made a small, high-pitched sound and yanked my head back towards hers. She pressed my lips tightly to hers and somehow managed to squeeze my male instrument even tighter in her velvet vice. Damn, I breathed. She giggled and kissed me again. Shannon, baby, I can't help myself. I have to, I choked. You'll have to wait a little longer, darling, she hissed. It will be much better this way if you are, my God, make me baby. Each syllable was emphasized by the fact that she pressed herself against me. I tried my best to restrain myself. Shannon had the ability to push me to the finish line so that I would fall afterward. It was hard to believe that I had only known to restrain myself. Shannon had the ability to push me to the finish line so that I would fall afterward. It was hard to believe that I had only known her for three months. The ringing sound of my phone made me lose all control. I reached the finish line in such a way that I almost lost consciousness. I looked down to see Shannon's reaction, and she was near the heights of climax. Her eyes rolled back into her head head, and her legs were spread out and trembling violently. Ooh. Baby, that's so good, she muttered. I swear to God, that's how it happened. What the hell are you trying to do to me, Shannon? I asked as my phone kept ringing. I'm trying to make you happy, Mark, she said slyly. I've been happy since I met you, I said. You'll be even happier when we're done, she grinned. Answer the call. It could be her. This was not the case. These were movers. I forgot that they were supposed to call me when they arrived. Shannon began to please my manhood, giving me caresses. I felt excited again. Suddenly my phone rang again. I knew from the number on the screen that it was her. I nodded to Shannon, who was looking at me expectantly. The look that appeared in those huge green eyes was part amusement and part evil grin. As Shannon rolled over and slid next to me, I was once again amazed at the work of art that was her body. Her legs were sculpted like the dancer she once was, and her heart-shaped butt would make the Kardashians jealous. Her tiny waist makes her ass look bigger than it actually is. But then that ass is so round that it looks like it belongs to a larger woman. God was truly in his glory when he performed this miracle. Shannon always says that God was so proud of his work on her ass that he was too busy to give her any breaths. I was in love again. Yes, again. It was only the second time for me, but this time everything was okay. This love was like a phoenix. 
she rose from the ashes of what came before her. I think I should start from the beginning. Three months ago, I looked like a bunch of poor idiots. I was in love with a woman who hated me. I think we both knew it, but I loved her. I was truly in love, and I foolishly thought that she loved me too. Of course, I knew there were problems in my marriage. We argued a lot back then. But I thought all married couples go through this. My eyes opened when my secretary entered my office and said that I had a visitor. When Shannon walked into my office and sat down, I was confused. So what company do you represent? I asked. I'm one of the you and me who take revenge on the corporation of idiots, she spat. I don't understand, I said. I know you don't know it, Mark, and it looks like it's going to hit you very hard, she said. She shrugged her tiny shoulders and moved on. Your wife is cheating on you. I thought I had heard wrong, but when I looked at her, she was so sure. She said it so casually and so matter-of-factly, as if she had just told me that the sky was blue. Somehow I knew she was telling the truth. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Sweat beaded on my forehead, and my heart began to pound wildly in my chest. My vision blurred at the edges and my eyes began to water. I felt like I was going to throw up at any second. Images of a faceless man on Anne, making her scream with pleasure, dominated my mind. Then the dam broke and the water began to flow. I put my head down on the table because, as a man, I didn't want this tiny red-haired woman to see me cry like some kind of child. Before I knew what was happening, I was enveloped in the scent of fresh cherries. I felt warm hands lift my head from the table, and I was surrounded by tenderness. I'm so sorry, she cooed. I never expected this. I guess I expected you to react the same way I did when I found out about it. I expected you to get mad and go out there and kick my boyfriend's ass. She sat on my desk with my head in her lap. She stroked my head, trying to calm me down. You love her, don't you? She asked, shaking her head, even though she cheats on you and never says anything good about you. Do you love her? When they are in bed, all she talks about is how you to argue and how you should do what she wants. I just do not understand. You try your best to support her, but she doesn't appreciate you or what you do for her. Why the hell do you care so damn much about her? She continued to stroke my head and talk out loud. The sound of her voice was soothing, and I began to wonder if she was trying to calm me down or if she was just talking to herself. It's because of the blonde hair and big breasts, isn't it? She asked. CG is also crazy about blondes with big breasts. I guess I expected more from you. I suddenly looked up at her. I don't know why I got so angry at her. I loved her before she bleached her hair, I spat, and I was the one who bought her those breasts. Her only response was a burst of laughter, so musical it stopped me in my tracks. What's so funny? I asked. I am telling the truth. I know, darling, she said, but my thick-headed ex has no idea that the woman of his dreams is mostly plastic. It probably took a lot of your money to make her look like that. I shook my head. It all seemed like a dream, but my anger grew. Shannon told me everything. She told me how they met and what was Anne's final plan. They discussed their options and thought they had found the best way to get rid of me, or at least get me out of Anne's life while keeping most of my money. Shannon herself was in a similar, albeit less legal, position. She supported CG from the moment they met, while he had a series of affairs with women who came to the bar where he worked part-time. He was apparently looking for his perfect blonde with big breasts, found Anne, and thought his dreams had come true. Besides the physical aspects that I paid for, Anne also seemed to give him a mother complex. Shannon paid a private investigator to get as much information as possible about CJ. I spoke with her agent, a woman named Sarah Price, several times and then accepted payment for her services. It really wasn't difficult. Having this information did Shannon no good. Sarah, another very pretty redhead, explained this to Shannon several times. Since Shannon and C.G. weren't married, this information meant nothing to her. C.G. could legally leave Shannon on a whim without any consequences. On the other hand, I could use Sarah's information and videotapes to strengthen my position in the divorce and reduce the amount of money I would have to give Anne and her boy, Toy. Over the weeks of watching and planning, Shannon and I grew closer. 
One night, this all led to a conversation. Shannon, you're too good for him, I told her. Why don't you just leave? Fuck him, she said, but I can't leave without paying. I never allow anyone to step over me. But isn't it enough that you found out what he does to prevent him from actually hurting you? You're not attached to him, so you're not stuck like I was, I asked. You are young and so beautiful. You have time to find someone who will love you the way you deserve. Her green eyes lit up, even in the dark interior of my Mustang. So you finally noticed, huh? She asked. Noticed what? I asked. Me? She grinned. I noticed you as soon as you entered my office. I blurted out. Bullshit, she laughed. You were so in love with Anne that you didn't even notice that I was a girl, let alone that I might be interested in you. Her laughter, as usual, charmed me. That was one of the things I loved most about her. Why do you think I'm still here? She choked. I ended things with CG and any need for revenge weeks ago. Helping you get revenge means a lot more to me than getting revenge on that idiot. I just hate the thought of you having to support these two scammers for the rest of their damn lives. There must be a way for us to get out of this, darling. She came straight to me, hugged me, and kissed me for the first time. I was shocked, but I liked it too much to even think about not kissing back. At 40, having been married for 20 years, I thought I knew how to kiss. But the only thing I knew was how Anne kissed. Kissing Shannon was completely different. The taste was different. The feeling was different. The whole experience was different. I couldn't get enough. I just kept kissing her and kissing her. After a while, we forgot that we were supposed to listen to the tape of our cheating partners. A voice behind us finally separated us. But Shannon refused to the tape of our cheating partners. A voice behind us finally separated us. But Shannon refused to let go of my hand. I thought so. Okay, I was hoping this would happen. Sarah smiled. You two are so cute, and you're so much better suited to each other than to the people you're in a relationship with. Now that you two are together, we can just let the scammers go. Such people will eventually get what they deserve. But what about his divorce and our revenge? Asked Shannon. Sarah surprised us then when she explained a few things about the law. The question is, do you want to be together enough to do this? Asked Sarah. Take some time to think about it. This is a big step. I'll send you the bill. She smiled. The next few weeks were spent planning this story. Shan and I worked on our acting skills. Each of us told our partners how busy we were at work. And it's amazing that they both believed us. Neither of them had any idea that Shannon and I knew each other, let alone that we had our own budding relationship. This gave us the opportunity to spend time together, and our mutual attraction blossomed into full-blown love. One day, I called Shannon at work and told her I was ready. I want, I think I need to spend more time with you, I told her. We're together almost every night, silly, she giggled into the phone. That's not enough, I said, but we haven't even slept together yet, she whispered. This told me that she was working and didn't want anyone there to hear her. I'm sure sex with you will be amazing, I told her. You have no idea, she cooed, but you know that I don't have such huge jugs as your wife, right? What difference does it make, I said. What makes sex great is when you love the person you're with and really want to please them. That's when she said it. She was almost in tears, and her voice broke. It was like she was just waiting to hear it from me. I love you too, Mark, and I swear it will always be like this. You can have any part of me you want, any time you want. I'm yours, she blurted out. I was stunned. No one, not even Anne when we were young, expressed her love for me so eloquently and passionately. And no, I never said anything like that to anyone before you. She said solemnly, even that asshole CJ. I wasn't worried about it, I said. I'm just wondering how quickly we can do this. We are following Sarah's plan. The phone call this morning was exactly what we were waiting for. The funny thing about all of this was that I truly and truly believe that fate played a role in bringing us together. For several weeks while we made our plans, we were very careful not to be seen together. But people we both knew kept coming to each of us and telling us that our loved ones were cheating on us. We had to try really hard to pretend we didn't know anything. It was a comedy of errors bordering on Shakespearean levels.
It was beginning to seem like only CG and Anne had any idea that we knew. And it was because the two scammers were so sure that they were much smarter than everyone else. My business trip has finally arrived. Okay, it was a fake business trip, but it worked. And luckily, Shannon's mother seemed to get sick at the same time. The fact that we were both supposedly out of town emboldened the scammers, and consequently, that fateful phone call. Things didn't go as smoothly as we had hoped. Both Shannon and I predicted the phone call would come on Friday night. That's why I arranged for the truck to arrive on Sunday morning. I wanted to give the lovebirds a couple of days to enjoy each other before it all blew up, but Shannon and I were enjoying the moment of victory when I answered the call. Mark, asked the voice of the woman to whom I had been married for more than 20 years. Who else can answer my phone? I asked joyfully. Shannon came over and hugged me, giving me strength I never thought I had. Why the hell are you calling me? I asked. I am your wife, she said. Mark, honey, I have to tell you something, and you probably won't like it. I think the easiest way to do this is to tell you that in the long run, it will be good for both of us. It may not seem like it now, but I just started laughing. And he laughed. I couldn't believe he was laughing at me. CG went downstairs to find out what was going on with the damn trucks. I thought they were in my yard. I wished that CG had been with me then. Why the hell are you laughing? I asked. I'm talking seriously. Well, the other day someone was talking to me, and they said you will put me on the shelf, he said in the same laughing voice. He really knew how to piss me off. Well, in a minute he'll be laughing from the other side of his ass, and that was what it was all about. This time I was determined to get the better of him. But let me tell you, I have some news for you. He continued, and you will soon find out what it is, then you'll have to dine alone. What the hell are you talking about? I asked. I don't think it was your idea at all, he laughed. I think this is CG's plan. Hell, he knew about me and CG. He said he heard some people talking about it, probably my nosy neighbors. I had to try to save myself. No, screw it all. I had to go through with it. Mark, I'm leaving you, I said. I want to get a divorce. I put as much power into my voice as I could, but all he did was laugh even more. The letter you wrote to me made me stop and wonder why. But I think you felt like you had to make things right, he laughed. His words chilled me to the bone. Was this bastard psychic? Nobody knew about this damn letter. Even CG had no idea that I had written a letter to Mark. The letter was supposed to accompany the divorce papers and it explained my feelings about our marriage and where we went wrong. It also explained in detail exactly what Mark had to do to get me back from CJ. Mark, we need to talk about this, I muttered. I think when you get home, we should do this. Just remember this, my girl, when you look at the sky, he sang. You can see the stars and still not see the light. Mark, are you eating? I asked in shock. I called the bastard to tell him we were done, and he was singing. He pretended to be glad that I was leaving him to unsettle me. Mark, if you don't change anything, we'll get divorced, I said. It's too late for that. Honey, I owe. Oh, how painful it is, he said. And in the background, I heard a woman's voice muttering something about how she is the only woman he better call sweet. Mark, it's never too late, I said. Why is it too late, Mark? And who is that woman next to you? Because I've already left, he sang, and I feel stronger. And I sing this victory song, ooh, ooh, my God, ooh, ooh. What the hell do you mean you already left? I screamed into the phone. Suddenly, the feeling I had been feeling all morning intensified. I had a feeling of dread that must have been caused by how Wheelie El Coyote feels just before the rock. He dropped on the roadrunner, begins to loom over his own head. I listened to the phone to hear Mark's answer, but all I heard was beeps. I threw the phone on the bed next to me just as CG ran into the room. The expression of fear on his face was tense. You need to get dressed and go downstairs, he said. I put on a robe and belted it so that my breasts would not fall out. There was a huge black woman standing in my fucking living room with a tablet, looking like she owned everything here. Who the hell are you? I asked. Get out of my house. She looked at me as if she was appraising me, and then turned her back to me. I'm in a charitable mood, she said. I know that your situation brings with it a lot of anger and resentment, 
but two things I will not tolerate are rudeness and any delays in my schedule. I have to vacate this house by the end of the day, and I intend to do this. Out of the same charity, I will give you a few minutes to collect your personal belongings, and I'm not going anywhere, I said. This house belongs to me and my husband. It's almost paid for. C.G. called the police. Yes, she said. C.G. called the police. This will speed up the process. This house is almost not paid for. It's fully paid. This will probably be the most embarrassing moment of your life, lady. I stared at her as C.J. took out his phone and dialed 911. A few moments, which seemed like an eternity to me, passed and gave me the opportunity to think. Then I thought about what Mark said. What was that damn victory song? What victory was he claiming? And then Hank K., the police chief and a personal friend of Mark and I, showed up. The woman walked past me and handed Hank a stack of papers. He looked over them and nodded his head several times. Then he came up to me. He looked past me to CJ. It is he, he asked. I asked again. Don't be irritated, he said. I'm just wondering if this is the guy you cheated on Mark with. It's damn daring of you to have him right here in Mark's house. Damn, I forgot. Mark sold the house. My head exploded. Before I could process what he had just said, a woman who was more than cheerful pushed her way through the moving crew. Is he? she asked. She walked slowly around CJ and then smiled at me. They said you were stupid, but I had to see it for myself. What the hell are you talking about? I asked. Half the women in town are wondering why you traded your husband for a guy with less manhood in pants and no income. She grinned. There may be some truth to the theory that when you put silicone in your breasts, it rots your brain. Follow my thoughts, Tina, said the police chief. He slowly walked up to CJ and asked, Hey guy, you know what a woman says to a guy with a really big male tool? Ah, uh, no, I don't know, CJ answered confusedly. How would you know, the boss answered. He and the fat woman burst out laughing. How would you know, the boss answered. He and the fat woman burst out laughing. We can continue, asked the black woman, wiping away tears of laughter. Okay, said the chief. And pack your shit and get out. Mark sold the house. But he can't, I screamed. This is my home. I chose him. But he paid for it and, said the chief. He bought it with his own money. His name is the only one on the document. He can do whatever he wants with it. Bullshit. A woman always gets a house and a divorce, I yelled. Not always, said the chief. Besides, you guys aren't getting divorced. Yes, that's true, I said. I'm going to apply tomorrow. Well, you should have applied last week, because that's when he sold the house, the boss chuckled. Isn't this illegal, I asked. No, the chief answered. It's a little sneaky and sneaky like having sex with some little shit eater while your husband is at work, making money to buy you all that shit, but it's definitely legal. Damn, I said. CG, call my lawyer. I need to call the bank and our investment firm. Do it outside, said the black woman. She waved her hand, and her team began removing furniture from the house. Where are they taking my furniture, I asked. Your husband donated furniture to a local charity auction house, she said. You can always buy it back. I chose each piece of this furniture, arranged it, and I started. Maybe you should have paid for that, Tina giggled. Yes, I forgot. Hair bleach interferes with your brain function, doesn't it? I ignored her and focused on the phone call to the bank. Carly, this is Ann Clayton. Yes, Mark's wife. Carly, my lawyer will be calling you very soon to freeze all of our accounts, so I need to withdraw the money before then. She spoke to me in her extremely cheerful voice on the phone. Carly, first things first, I said. We can chat later. I will need enough money to maintain the house and pay expenses for some time. And when the freeze continues, are only the current account assets frozen, or will Mark be able to direct his direct deposit to another account? Only the current contents of the accounts, she said. But I think he already transferred his direct deposit last week when he quit his job. What did he do? I asked in horror. Shit, Carly. I want to take all the money out of our accounts. I want to transfer all this to a new account, okay? Are you sure you want to take all this? She asked. Hell yes, I said. Mark will find another job faster than Tina can empty a bucket of chicken wings. 
but this money is all I have until the court agrees to divorce. I'll have to write you a check for that amount, and then you have to come and deposit it into your new account, she said. Okay, I snapped, just do it. It's done, she said. As soon as you arrive, I'll give you a check for $3.11, and you can do it. What the hell are you talking about, Carly? I screamed. There's almost half a million dollars in this account. There was, she began. I know how many were there, I hissed. That's exactly what happened last week. Chief, this must be illegal, I said. It's not illegal, he said, but it's pretty bad. Him. Yeah, he said. The bank has a minimum balance rule. If your account balance drops below $50, you will have to pay a fee of $10. You don't have enough money left to even pay the commission. CG handed me the phone and I began talking to my lawyer in a rapid mixture of words and sobs. I told him about how Mark sold the house and withdrew all the money from the bank accounts. As I spoke, I logged into our investment account and discovered that Mark had cashed out all of our investments. He left only one share in the cheese company. That's Dan Smart, my lawyer said. He beat you to the punch. This is all very legal. Until the divorce is filed, he can do whatever he wants with all his assets. So he took everything. He's probably going to cash it all out and put it in a bunch of offshore accounts that we can't reach. He wants to increase his capital to such an extent that in a divorce, you won't get a damn thing. And leaving work is brilliant. When he shows up in court with no money and no job, you two will just go your separate ways without any strings attached. I don't think he'll show up at all, I said. I think he left town. I think he left me before I could leave him. I have no idea where he is. Hey, my lawyer asked, how are you going to file documents for him if you don't know where he is? Can't I divorce him without all this? I asked, what about abandonment? In this state, it takes three years. Do you have enough money to last that long? He asked, remember, I just told you that he took all our fucking money, idiot. I hissed, wow, he said, no money means you can't pay me, click. And again, I only heard beeps, but added to this was the sound of the movers giggling at me in a low voice. That's how my life went to hell. I temporarily moved in with my mother. Mark was meticulous. He sold or gave away all our assets. He took all three cars he drove. Both his Mustangs and the Jeep he drove during the winter were gone. He kept my new Lexus, but I was unable to pay for it, and it was soon returned. I hired several free lawyers, and they all told me how angry I had to make him do what he did. Almost all the lawyers, when told the facts of the situation, agreed that it was brilliant and completely legal. There is no law in the country that says a man must live with a woman just because they are married. There is also no law against selling a home that you have title to. And Mark had every right to withdraw money from our accounts, since he was the one who opened these accounts. He was back on top. I tried to call him, but found that his number was no longer in service. There was a hint there. I was sure he had somehow left me a message. I was too stupid to understand it. Days turned into weeks without a word from him. The weeks stretched into months. I lost CG before the first month was over. He was struggling to pay rent on the apartment he shared with his girlfriend. Then he found a letter. His girlfriend left him for another guy the same day Mark left me. What are the chances of that happening? One day I was listening to the radio and just burst into tears. There was a band I'd vaguely heard about called The Eagles. One of their lead singers, a guy named Glenn Free, sang a song called Already Gone. It told a story so similar to my life that it made me cry. The nonsense that Mark said or sang to me that day when he left me with his preemptive strike was taken directly from this song. My whole life consisted of hard work. I worked six days a week cleaning hotel rooms with my mother. Many of our guests reminded me of how I lived before. I always took what I had for granted. I always believed that I had the right to more. And after just a few days of working just to survive, I began to regret the way I treated my husband. I hated to remember that I used to spend more on makeup than my current salary in two weeks. I also knew that at 43 my prospects were limited. The only thing that was strange was that after three years of bad food and hard work, I gained a few pounds. I also stopped dyeing my hair. One day when I returned home,
An invitation was waiting for me. The next day, I was invited to a local cafe. The invitation was unsigned, but I knew it was from Mark. Suddenly, it made sense. Mark could have drained our accounts, but he left a strange amount of money. He left $3.11. It's been three years, one month, and one week since he left me. That's it. My sentence was finished. My repentance is over. Dan, I wish I had thought of this earlier. I could go on a diet and get my body back. Then I realized that it didn't matter. Mark always loved me. Blonde hair and big breasts were my idea. While I was trying to look my best, something occurred to me. I suddenly remembered the last line of the song that Mark had quoted to me before he beat me and left me before I could try to divorce him. The line was, it happens so often that we live in chains that we don't even know we have the key. There was a message in the invitation. It said we had come full circle. I was sure that this meant that he was ready to bring me back into his life. It suddenly dawned on me that I had been a fool. I was always in control of the situation. I sat on my butt day after day while Mark went out and worked his butt off to buy me everything I asked for. The only time he refused to do what I asked was when I tried to force him to do something he didn't want to do. And when I tried to divorce him, when I tried to force him to do something he didn't want to do. And when I tried to divorce him, when I tried to leave him, he took it personally. As usual, he gave me what I wanted. He left first. The strange thing was that I had spent the last three years dreading the day when the inevitable would happen. I was sure that sooner or later the divorce papers would arrive, but they never came. I was pretty sure I now knew why. Mark still loved me. I was looking forward to meeting him again. I arrived at the bar a little earlier. There was a shabby-looking bartender who had drunk too much and had that ruddy complexion that is a sure sign of an alcoholic. He approached my table. Damn it, you've gotten fat, he said. How many donuts have you eaten in the last three years? Have you had enough to drink that you've forgotten what a tiny manly tool you have? I asked. What are you doing here, CJ? I still work here, he said. What are you doing here? I received an invitation to have lunch at a small street cafe across the street. I said. I came here to drink, to gain courage. This is strange, he said. This is too big a fucking coincidence. What do you mean? I asked. I also have an invitation, he said. Hey, did yours have a weird riddle on it? I wouldn't call it a mystery, I said. It was Mark's way of telling me that he wanted me back. What exactly was written there, he asked. If you want to know, I told him. It says we've come full circle. I'm ready to give you what you want. You're right, he said. Yours is different from mine. There was a question in my invitation. Why does a squirrel hide its nuts in its nest? I have no idea what that means, I said. I think that means Shannon wants me back too, he said. The squirrel hides nuts in its nest to protect them from birds. Understood. The English call women birds. This is Shannon's way of telling me that she doesn't want me to belong to other women. I think they worked together and decided to bring us back after a certain time. They wanted us to suffer and be willing to take them back on their terms. To hell with all this, I said. Anger made me forget everything I had learned over the past three years. If Mark wants me back, he'll have to kiss my ass for a long time this time. I left the bar with my head full of steam and headed across the street to the cafe. I sat down at a small table and looked around. I actually saw CG enter the cafe. He sat down at a small table on the sidewalk next to where two college guys were playing hacky sack. As soon as CG sat down, I thought about his riddle and realized that he was wrong. I waved at him desperately, but he was too distracted by the guys. Then he saw me. He waved at me and shook his head, but I didn't understand his message. The guys next to him lost control of the small bag. He flew towards CG and knocked over his glass. He stood up angrily just as a small bag fell off the table and landed in front of him. One of the guys walked up and it looked like he was trying to skillfully kick the bag back into the air to restart the game. He swung his leg wildly and missed the bag. At least the bag wasn't damaged. His foot flew into CG's crotch with all his might. TG's scream was so loud that I was sure it could be heard a mile away. I ran up to him just as the waiters tried to help him. All they could do was try to help him to his feet.
None of them wanted to try to examine the site of his injury. I got to him just as the ambulance was taking him away. Your answer was wrong, I said. He looked at me through a veil of pain. What? He groaned. She didn't want you to come back, I said. This has nothing to do with birds. The squirrel hides its nuts. Nuts are your reproductive organs, not a damn thing, he grumbled. He started to say something else, but was interrupted by the appearance of a girl who looked like a college student. She was tall and fair-haired, just like I once was. Her hair was a really gorgeous shade of blonde, and it was her real hair color. Her breasts were almost as big as mine, and judging by the way they moved, they were real. She was holding a briefcase and chewing gum in her hands. Are you Anna Clayton? She asked. Of course, I answered angrily. She handed me a stack of papers. What is it? I asked. His list of demands. Why don't you ask him yourself? You've been served, she spat. I looked around the cafe and saw him. Suddenly, I also understood my riddle. Full circle meant I got what I wanted, but that didn't mean I got Mark back. This meant that I got what I wanted while Mark left me. I got divorced. The problem was that meant that I got what I wanted while Mark left me. I got divorced. The problem was that it was no longer what I wanted. I dreamed of the life I once had and lost. But to be honest, I was used to not having a lot of money. Most of all, I wanted to return to Mark himself. And then I noticed him. He looked good. He looked even better than when we broke up. He looked happy, but he was not alone. There was a woman with him. She was red-haired, she was young, very beautiful, and really pregnant. Between them, clutching each of their hands, was a little girl who was the perfect combination of their features. She had the color of Mark's hair and her mother's sparkling green eyes. She, this tiny little girl, looked at me with the same strange little smile that Mark had. Maybe it's genetic, or maybe she somehow knew what was going on, and what it all meant, just like I did. I realized as soon as I saw them together that it was definitely over now. There was no chance that I would ever get Mark back. Emotionally, he was out of touch. There was no point in fighting to get his heart back. This redhead will never give up on him. She gave him her heart, her love, and undoubtedly her body. She also gave him children. I looked through the divorce papers and saw how Mark was taking revenge on me. I planned to take my husband's money using the court system. I needed this man's money without him. In the end, I received neither one nor the other. He divorced me on the grounds that he abandoned me. This meant that he walked away with all his money and his wonderful life intact. I looked up from my papers to take one last look at the man I had lost, but it was too late. He has already gone, and all I have left are tears. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.